This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, for birth mothers in adoptions, stigma and silence persist. How do I not feel shame and guilt every single day? The magnitude of making that decision and then living with it is almost impossible. One mother shares her experience. Women who place their children up for adoption have been shamed and silenced for centuries. Young pregnant women used to be shipped off to maternity homes, hidden away and told to move on with their lives without their child once they gave birth. Today, many birth mothers still have to overcome stigma when they place a child up for adoption. Many don't have access to the mental health resources they need. That's how it was for Hope Baker. At 21 years old, she placed her son in an open adoption. After she gave birth, her whole world changed. I was going through carrying this on my shoulders and struggling and struggling with alcohol, just trying to numb myself and trying to figure out how do I hold this inside and how do I not feel shame and guilt every single day? How, how do you go on with your life when you know that your child is living in this world, but in a whole completely separate world, whether it's an open adoption or not? I mean, the magnitude of making that decision and then living with it is almost impossible. I mean, there are some days where it's impossible, even for me now, eight years out. Baker's book about her experience is called Finding Hope, A Birth Mother's Journey into the Light. Birth mothers are sometimes the forgotten side of adoption. We think about those who are adopted, about 2% of U.S. residents or 6 million people. We consider how they may never know who they really are and the mental health struggles that come with that because they were part of a closed adoption. But a closed adoption also means the birth mother likely knows nothing about the adoptive parents or what became of her child. And that's how it goes about. And in a lot of these cases... And older adoptions, right, and generations ago, this is how all adoption was done. So you see a huge rate of people now who are searching for either their children they place for adoption or the adoptees looking for their birth parents. So as you look at the industry now, primarily adoptions are open, whether there's different levels of openness. I mean, I know birth moms who literally spend holidays with the children they place for adoption. But for some birth moms, that's not the relationship they either want or felt like they could handle. And same with adoptive parents. Some adoptive parents only want a degree of openness. So it comes from both sides. Only nine states allow adoptees over age 18 or 21 unrestricted access to their sealed birth records. In 19 states and DC, records cannot be accessed without a court order. For adoptees who grew up not knowing anything about their birth parents, access to that birth certificate can be life-changing. For adoptees, it is like something that will ground them, right? And they finally feel like they know where they came from. They have the piece of paper that shows who they are. As a birth mom, I have my son's original birth certificate sitting in my office. And I look at it every single day as a reminder that for a moment in time, he was mine and only mine. And my name is on that birth certificate as his mom. And that document is one of the most important, I wouldn't call it a possession, but just one of the most important things to me because it's the one thing that I had that says that yes, I'm his mom. That history of silence and secrecy has meant that many birth mothers have never felt safe to talk about it in the way they desperately need. Baker says COVID-19 has changed some of that by normalizing remote communication. Birth mothers are often more comfortable sharing their stories via video instead of having to do so in person. When COVID hit, one of the bonuses for birth mothers was that everything went virtual. So you no longer had to go show your face at a meeting or try to find a support group. You could join virtual groups and you could keep your video off. And so I have been in many groups where there have been women in their 70s. And there's one woman in particular who I constantly think about on that support group. That was the first time she had ever told anybody that she had placed a baby for adoption. And this woman was in her 70s. And this is the reality of a lot of birth moms and not just back then. Even today, 
it was a shame your parents, the church, the maternity home you went to, the agencies you worked with. It was the entire system putting that shame on you. Jeanette Yaff agrees. She's a foster and adoption therapist in Los Angeles and founder of the Celia Center, a nonprofit supporting anyone connected to foster care. Yoff was also an adoptee herself at age seven. Her birth mom had mental health issues and was unable to care for her, and her birth father rejected her when she sought him out as a teenager. Today, Yoff is passionate about keeping families together when possible. Mental health services for her birth mother might have helped, but she says when she first began working with adoptees and birth parents as a foster care social worker with DCF Los Angeles, She was stunned at how birth mothers were being treated. There was such a negative stigma towards birth parents that was shocking and demoralizing and inhumane. The treatment, the disregard, the disrespect, and understanding unmet mental health needs for birth parents. DCFS is about keeping children safe, but who's supporting and helping that birth family find and have and receive the resources that they need to be parents. Part of that, sadly, is grieving. Moving through grief is necessary to survive long-term with mental health relatively intact. But Yoff says stigma and shame prevent birth mothers from being able to experience grief and begin to move through their trauma. It's acceptable for a birth mother to have grief for, oh, maybe a period of a short amount of time. Most birth mothers are told, if you love this child, you will go on with your life. Forget this ever happened. It's not acknowledged to begin with. It's grief seems unacceptable for birth mothers. And it's a short while that, oh, she may feel grief, but it's not acknowledged that this is going to last a lifetime. And birth mothers are not provided with education, psychoeducation, that grief is normal. We want to give them permission to exercise their grief, exercise this choice that they're making, which is a sacrifice. For Baker, the expectation that she would move on stunted her emotional recovery. Without the freedom to have open conversations with friends or family or seek mental health treatment, she says she self-medicated with drugs and alcohol. The year after I placed, I mean, there were moments where I had to call my mom and say, I think I'm going to die because I'm putting myself in situations that are so dangerous because I can't get out of whatever's going on. I don't know how to fix myself. I don't know how to get over this as they tell you to do. How do you get over such a huge, you know, like the magnitude of that decision of placing your child? And there was this moment where I was on a three-day bender and I started shaking in the fetal position on the floor. And I was, the first thing that popped into my mind was, How long am I going to be here before somebody finds me? So what could have gone differently to help when Baker placed her child? She says a lot, starting with simple paperwork. The relinquishment of rights. When I think of that specific piece, in no way, shape, or form should it ever be legal to sign paperwork before your baby is born. Ever. That should be changed. Like, And this is just, I'm going to drop this in a bucket. I actually signed my papers in the hospital within 24 hours after giving birth, I think that should be illegal. I'm not angry that that happened in my scenario, but in no way, shape or form was I in the right emotional or state to do that. Baker also points out that mandatory mental health treatment didn't exist following the birth, something she thinks simply must be funded. There aren't laws in place in every state that say you have to have post-placement care. So when you think about how much it costs to adopt a child, anywhere from thirty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars, where in that cost is their funds being allocated to post placement care to ensure that that woman who just gave birth and placed their child in another person's arms, regardless of the, this why she did that, what decisions were made, what does that post placement care look like? Yoff also says there are biological factors to adoption that rarely get considered. What we tend to do in adoption is not let the mother hold the baby. She's now left with this grief. She's not releasing the oxytocin. She gets stuck in this trauma. 
No one's helping her release this oxytocin. And now the baby is going into the arms of someone that that doesn't smell like her, doesn't sound like her, has a different rhythm than her. And that emotionally dysregulates the baby. And this is psychological. Some of those biological factors may be impossible to completely bridge. But both Baker and Yoff agree that open lines of communication have a positive impact for both the birth parents and adoptive parents. I've coined a new term, which is open adoption facilitator. We need a third party who comes in to mediate like you would a divorce. What is the open adoption agreement? What does it look like? What are the expectations? And it's not legally binding, but it's an expectation of consideration that yes, the birth mother would like to have contact and there's different levels of contact. It really comes down to both parties compromising and listening to each other's wants and deciding what's best Mm. together in focusing on what's in the best interest of the child. Eventually, Baker was able to get the mental health help she needed. She says for all birth mothers, time and self-exploration are an important part of navigating life post-placement. Maybe it's squeezing a stress ball. Maybe it's calling a friend. Maybe it's reading through an affirmation card. Being able to acknowledge those. I mean, I think I went on this entire path of first off, surrounding myself with the right people, finding a therapist who was adoption competent, right? And knew the journey, whether it was, you know, birth moms and just the trauma of that, knew what that experience was on training. And then on the spiritual side of just finding ways to build myself up in my environment. The adoption of Baker's son was open. She recently got back from a trip to see him, her first time since the pandemic began. We went to the beach, we went strawberry picking. And, you know, I think when kids hit certain ages, like last time I was there, he was so just like a normal five, six year old, right? And now he's just maturing. And it's so interesting to just see him like a little man, right? He's not a toddler anymore. He's just like a mature, interesting, funny little dude. And he calls me Hopi and it was just, You know, it's incredible. Even if you had told me that this level of openness and communication would have been here five years ago, I probably wouldn't have thought that that was possible. Baker wants other birth moms to know that all adoptions might not look like hers right away or ever. And that's okay. Sometimes you have to go through those, whether it's 5, 10, 15, or until they're 18 to get that relationship. And I can tell you the level that I felt just from my last visit to this week, I think it took eight years to get there. And we're there. We've always had an open relationship, but it feels different now. Both Baker and Yoff agree that if the discussion around adoption is ever going to change, the first step is just to start the conversation. Let's stop disenfranchising this and pushing it away and ignoring it because what we resist persists. And this is getting bigger and bigger. You can find out more about all of our guests on our website, RadioHealthJournal.org. Our writer-producer for this segment is Libby Foster. I'm Reed Pence.